Hello everyone and welcome. We are Oxford Brooks Racing. We welcome you today to our talk about the implementation of Altair software into the design of the major components of our Formula Student race car. So first, let me present my teammates, Raquel Esteban, the Vehicle Dynamics Lead, and Soma Funa, the Suspension Lead for OBR20 Class 1. My name is Asir Sebastian and I am the former of OBR20 Suspension Lead for Class 2 and the Sub Lead for Class 1. Today, we will be talking about the major components designed by OBR engineers this season using Altair Hyperworks. We will, we will start with a brief introduction to the team and the relationship we have with Altair, the OBR20 race car, and some of the major suspension design implications. Raquel will then be giving us a detailed process of how the suspension operates were optimized and designed. And finally, Shaw will present the design process for the bespoke carbon fiber rims. Oxford Brooks Racing is an award-winning Formula student team established in 1999, each year with the goal of designing, manufacturing and race a single-seater race car in engineering design competitions held across the world. We first started collaborating with Altair back in 2017, where the first titanium upgrades were designed with Hyperworks. The SLM manufacturing method was used, allowing us to design hollow sections and thus reduce weight. Unfortunately, we could not race with those uprights due to manufacturing issues. In 2018, new uprights were designed, and topology optimization was used to a great extent, saving up to 51% of the mass. We raced for two years with this uprights design, and we had two very successful seasons. In 2019, we started to use composites FEA for concept rims, aero components, and chassis validation. Finally, in 2020, we had the biggest collaboration with Altair to date. Following the workshop with Altair, we have been making use of OptiStruct for composites FEA in chassis and carbon fiber rims, and full design and optimization of the upgrades, which also serves as the housing for the powertrain gearbox and electric motor. Also, Inspire has been used for rapid design generation of suspension components. Therefore, we keep collaborating with Altair because Hyperworks is the only FEA package that provides the reliable outcomes required for these critical components, independently of how on the material and manufacturing process used, such as the carbon fiber and the 3D printed titanium components. This year's race car is the OBR20, which is the first full electric race car designed by OBR. It features four electric motors, one per wheel, with a peak power of 80 kilowatts. This type of powertrain layout offers the possibility to implement region braking, torque vectoring, traction control, and much more. The transition to electric has increased the mass of our race car significantly, mainly due to the battery, with a weight of 45 kilograms. The addition of the electric motor plus the gearbox on each wheel assembly also contributes to this increase. Consequently, the main objective of the department was to compensate the extra mass by drastically reducing the weight of our suspension components. The main weight reduction comes from the topology optimized uprights, saving up to 30% on each corner, and the bespoke composite rims with a weight reduction of more than 50%. I will now hand it to my colleague Raquel to go in more depth in the uh, upright designs. Hello everyone and welcome. As my colleagues here introduced me, my name is Raquel and I was Vehicle Dynamics Lead during 2020 season in OBR. Today we're going to explain a case study using Alta Hyperworks software based on the uprights for our first electric prototype. To begin with, we will talk about how we determine the design requirements and constraints that will define the setup of the model, then how the software using topology optimization optimizes the design according to them and to end up how we carry out the interpretation of the results and validate them to send them straight to manufacturing. In OVR, accurate calculations for designing new components are crucial in the first steps of the process. This is why we analyze every single possible scenario that can happen when the car is running, determine the stream cases and evaluate the component in the worst case to make sure its performance and resistance fulfills our objectives. This is what we did for calculating the load cases that the upright would be submitted to. The team developed a, a tool which calculated the weight transfer and therefore the forces transferred from the tires to the upright and transformed intent from them 
into forces accepting the suspension arms. This is an easy way for us to obtain both tire and suspension forces, depending on which lateral and longitudinal accelerations the car is submitted to, and it would also allow to introduce many other variables such as braking torque, which is also an output of these calculations. With this tool, we calculated the axial forces through the suspension arms, which are then introduced into Hyperworks. The value of these forces is set to the maximum lateral longitudinal acceleration cases that we estimated that could be happening in the car, looking at track data from past competitions. As inputs, this tool uh, in needs the geometry of the car, which is shown at the right side of the slide, and the kinematic of the suspension system, or pickup points, which are on the left side. We also take into consideration aero loads, any additional vertical load that in the tires, such as bumps, and the static weight of the car. This way, the tool takes, takes into account the whole car to calculate the unitary vectors of the forces and the length of each component coming from a uh, suspension geometry, so the axial loads are accurate enough. Once the unitary vectors and the weight transfer are computed, the, to the tool allows us to evaluate the maximum tension and compression loads in each of the components in the suspension system, such as A-arms or tie rods or push and pull elements. In our case, A would be push rod. This is evaluated by introducing cornering bump and breaking magnitudes. Uh, uh, introduced in, in G's, acceleration in G's. So from track data that we've gathered in past season, we can estimate those values with, um, with more or less accuracy because obviously our car was, was a com was combustion car in the previous season and this year is completely different. But uh, to make uh, a global idea out of it, uh, we, use, we use data from, from, from past seasons. And then we create the load cases according to them. Some of the cases we define would be maximum acceleration, corning and braking with maximum bump, each of them separately. And then the combination of all, of uh, corning and braking and bump, changing the value of, of the G magnitude to evaluate the, the effect of these chains too. So as you can see in the table in the slide, uh, we, we have um, the, front, the front suspension system and the rear suspension system and then uh, the columns would be the load cases changing the Gs that, that we mentioned before and that we evaluate. Then at the right side of the table, uh, they're computed the maximum compression and tension um, values of the forces of the axial loads for each of the components. And those are the numbers that we um, use to introduce the, to introduce the loads in, into Hyperworks. So once we've calculated the load cases that we're going to use in the simulation, it's time to set up the, the model in Hyperworks. The software imports the geometry straight from CAD, as it can be seen in the slide. Um, the geometry is composed by blocks, which has uh, approximately the same shape as the overall geometry of the upright and the overall dimensions of it. And there are some parts that must remain untouched in the optimization process. An example of these areas can be the motor attachment which is marking gray in the center of the upright. We don't want this piece of the upright to be optimized because we have already designed the, the geometry and the attachments and how the motor is going to be mounted in the upright. So we don't want that area to be optimized. And then the rest of the, of the geometry is, is composed by blocks because we want the software to optimize that part and to decide where we can remove material or keep a certain amount um, regarding the load cases and the load paths that the software calculates. So once we've selected uh, all these uh, previous steps, we need to uh, set up uh, the model. This is done by cards uh, because Hyperworks is a very me methodical tool, as as we as we found out uh, while using it, and everything needed to complete the scene is implemented step by step. So some cards that we've used to set up the model would be uh, the properties and material cards. In these ones, we introduce the properties of the material that the MTC um, provides because we don't want to use um, wrong, the wrong properties. We, we want to really know what, uh, what kind of material they're going to use and how they're going to use it. So we ask them directly to provide those, those variables. For these cards, we, diff we, we need um, the density of the material and the yield strength. 
the rest of, of the properties of the material computed by means of the software internally. Then some, some other cards that we use would be the load collectors and the load cases. These two cards uh, define uh, the, the vectors of the actual loads that we're going to use and we're going to implement, as you can see in, in the slides, those lines that come uh, in certain points would be the vectors of the forces uh, that we calculated by means of our tool and then we implement in, in the software. And we can implement um, as many load cases as we want, but we decided to go for three, which are the most critical ones that we, that we calculated. And then we can add some constraints such as uh, simulate if, we, if we're simulating breaking, we can sim we can um, implement a constraint in the break path, simulating the the break path, but acting as as a constraint. And then the load steps and the load the cards that, that means the load step would um, would use a load case that is associated to that to that step. And, and combine with the rest of the load cases to find the final optimization in the shape of the load paths. And then you can actually uh, add some more cards to include um, what kind of mesh are you going to use, um, what kind of restriction do you want in terms of uh, memory usage from your computer, and you have many, many options to, to choose from. Once the simulation has converged and we're able to see the results, this is the kind of window that we uh, come up with once the once the, the, the simulation is finished. Um, the way the software shows the results is by means of um, element densities percentage. These represent the amount of material that is needed in certain areas depending on the load cases that we've decided to implement. And it shows them by means of a color scale, in which the red is, would be 100% material or 100% uh, density, and the blue region would be um, the less needed material. So we could actually remove that excess from from the final design in case it was convenient for us. So the picture that we that we show in here corresponds to the iteration 37 out of 40. That was the total amount of iterations that the software needed to converge in, in the simulation. And um, as you can see, the, the red area that we constrained to be untouched, there was the monitor attachment, uh, is completely red. So uh, we need the whole uh, material that we introduced at first in, in the software to, to fulfill the load cases that we, that we set up. And then the blue regions would be um, where the suspension arms are attached. So we can see that actually um, the load cases that we base the simulation on, uh, the, the actual forces of, of, the, uh, of, this, of the suspension arms would be way less important in this, in this simulation than the, um, the motor torque that we implemented. That's why um, the blue regions in the in those attachments uh, are appearing because that material is not needed because the software considers that the load is not enough to to keep that amount of material. So, but 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 in the end, uh, we need those attachments. So we need material in those regions. So we kind of this this comes a compromise in between what the software tells you and what you actually need to to fulfill your design. And in our case, we couldn't remove that material from the blue areas because we actually need that material uh, to to uh, to actually attach the suspension to the upright. So, uh, in this compromise between what you need and what is what tells you, is what we introduce into SolidWorks with these results, and we come up with the final um, with the final shape of the upright, which can be seen in the red side of of this slide. Um, Obviously, this is not um, easy work. We have to take into account that what the software tells you could be the best way of the optimal way, but you need uh, to also to take into account what what your design restrictions are, how the manufacturer is going to um, 
affect that design because you have to take into account the manufacturing process as well. So um, with all these requirements, we come up with the final uh, shape, which is that one. And then I'm going to uh, leave you with, with Asir. He's going to explain you how the machine process is, is done and why it's important for, for us in the simulations. Thank you very much. As my colleague Raquel mentioned, after the optimization of the mass and stiffness of the uprights, the 3D uprate is designed on CAD accordingly to the solution. Small geometry features are removed from the FEA CAD model as they will only increase the number of elements on the mesh and the stress analysis results will not be affected. The mesh generated to study the stress distribution is formed by 3D second order tetrahedral elements. These elements allow to have additional mid nodes that capture the formations more accurately as the stiffness of each element is lower compared to the first order elements. The main drawback of these 3D elements used is the computing time, which is slightly increased. The 3D mesh is generated first by a 2D surface mesh of cell elements. The quality of these elements and the connectivity between them is then checked. It is crucial that the 2D mesh uh, encloses one and only one continuous volume. There must be no duplicates and no free edges, otherwise the 3D mesh will not be created. Right after that, we generate the tetrahedral mesh that will fill in the enclosed volume by the cell elements. The quad elements split uh, into two triads to create elements under them, such as the ones as we see on the, on the slide, or directly the quad can be kept and a pyramid will be created under them instead. Finally, the original surface mesh is deleted. The quality of the 3D one is evaluated with the check elements feature, in which parameters such as the aspect ratio, dead collapse, Jacobian, etc. are examined. It is also possible to repair the elements that do not satisfy the quality requirements for the mesh with the mesh optimization box that, Hyper, that Hyperworks uh, has. The same loading conditions described by my colleague Raquel are implemented on a linear static analysis on several load cases that are then studied individually. A linear static analysis is performed due to the simplicity of the setup and the lower computing time. A non-linear study would require a more accurate model on, and greater FEA skills to determine the validity of the results. Furthermore, the uprights are designed to always work on the elastic region of the material far from the yield strength point and therefore a non-linear analysis is not required. The results are displayed on Hyperview where the stress map using the von Mises criteria is shown. The yield strength of the used titanium is 830 megapascals and consequently we must make sure that the maximum stress on the entire component does not go any higher than that. If this was not the case, a redesign of the component would have to be done in order to strengthen that specific zone and run another simulation. Displacements are also shown on Hyperview. And finally, the manufacturing process is done uh, by the MTC, the Manufacturing Technology Center, in a process called electron beam melting. This 3D manufacturing process allows us to achieve the complex geometry design through the topology optimization. Consequently, Mass is reduced while keeping the required stiffness by design. And now I will hand it to my colleague uh, Sean, who will be talking about the carbon fiber uh, rings. Thank you, Asir. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Sean Mufuna. Uh, I was the OBR20 suspension lead. Um, and I want to take you through how we've used Hyperworks um, to help us with the design of our bespoke composite wheels. So why have we gone for bespoke composite wheels? Well, as mentioned before, this year our new package in our powertrain design has uh, resulted in an inherently large increase in unsprung mass. Uh, so going for bespoke composite uh, wheels um, as opposed to the standard aluminium wheels um, helps us save uh, quite a bit of weight. Uh, not only are we intending on saving weight with design, but we're aiming at reducing wheel deflection. Uh, we've had we've attempted to house as much of the powertrain um, system within the rim uh, to you know reduce the protrusion of the motors um, between the wheel and 
the body of the vehicle. Uh, this is done to improve the flow of air uh, to our aerodynamic components um, as well as avoid the collision of uh, the suspension links with the protruding motors. Uh, the implication of minimizing this protrusion results in a wheel design that's highly cantilevered with respect to its uh, mounting points. Uh, therefore, you know, the use of carbon fiber allows us to guard against this uh, potential rim deflection. So, pairing the smaller tire selection that we've gone with this year with uh, the, again, new powertrain design um, has opposed complex design constraints on the wheel design. Um, so the bespoke nature uh, of our concept allows us the versatility to come up with a feasible solution. Uh, we therefore have come up with a two-part composite rim made up of tiered 100 woven and unidirectional pre preg materials. Uh, the wheels are molded A side out uh, to ensure a clean finish on the bead seat uh, to, prefer, to uh, prevent from the common leakage issues seen in composite wheels. Now, having this wonderful and thought through design concept is all great, uh, but again, to ensure the structural integrity and failure mitigation of the wheel, we require to um, run this design uh, through an FEA. Um, using a trusted and accurate platform. Uh, this is where Altair's Hyperworks 2019X have benefited our design process um, with the use of its, its extensive uh, composites analysis, analysis toolbox uh, in Opsustruct. Uh, we're able to analyze um, our design in a confident manner. So to begin this analysis, uh, we first had to prepare the shell in our CAD software. Um, this was uh, designed as a shell model uh, which represented the outer surface of the wheel um, which was then also split up into various uh, sections I'll go into that further um, we used the same load links calculator um, as Raquel had uh, illustrated earlier uh, to derive uh, the X, Y and Z forces um, that you would see at the contact patch uh, resulted from vehicle uh, accelerations um, so the load case we've used to simulate the wheels was a severe load casing in which the vehicle is braking, cornering and hitting a curb. Uh, so careful consideration was given to determine uh, the respective constraints and loading regions of where uh, the wheel would be fixed and where the resultant forces would be acted upon. Uh, again, this is where the CAD shell model was split into uh, various faces. Um, this has helped us um, uh, dictate where the respective um, contact patch loads uh, you know would would be loaded onto the to the room. So for example the X force was assumed to be on the uh, both of the inner halves of the bead seat, Y force on the uh, inner rim edge, um, and Z force um, on a calculated uh, segment at the bottom um, of the rim. Um, we've also added the additional load of the tire air pressure. Uh, so using uh, Hyperworks uh, we easily generated uh, the TD mesh uh, for the inputted segments um, uh, with consideration to the material layout we also uh, corrected the uh, element normals just to make sure they're in the direction in which we'd be laying up the materials. Uh, the segregation of the rim into the region made for the construction of the remote load elements a lot easier, namely RB2 for the constraints and RBE3 for the loads. Um, this allowed us to simply apply the load cases, um, load case forces uh, from a single point at the contact patch um, to the respective regions. Uh, we used the, lo the load add function to ensure that uh, all the loads were applied to the wheel for the static analysis uh, representing the load case. So for the material definition, um, we set them up, set them up as uh, P-Comp uh, property cards, uh, just as this would give us the correct failure criterions. Um, and the material properties which we used were the same properties that we derive from our physical in-house tests or tests performed by our suppliers. Uh, in terms of our ply laminate and 
um, client laminate definitions. Um, you know, composites are not a new thing for uh, OBR as we've used them extensively in our intricate error packages uh, with the help of you know, OBR alumni currently working in the F1 industry. We developed a ply layup sequence uh, from first principles um, that we thought would be suitable for the design of uh, the wheels. Uh, this <coughs> We ended up with uh, a design where we had a base of 10 plies um, of the T800 fabric for both uh, parts of the rim. Um, but then we've substituted an additional three plies of T800 UD material uh, in the barrel section uh, to reduce the deflection. Um, so by having the different rim uh, sections all split, um, it allows us to create a single laminate for the model. Um, we've grouped the split face elements into sets, um, allowing us to assign the various portions of the rim to the correct plies. Uh, once all the plies are defined, we may manage to generate a laminate which resulted in the exact same layup sequence as we derived on paper. So once the FE had been run from OptiStruct, uh, we were then able to analyze and evaluate the results in Hyperview. Now with OptiStruct allowing to output the various composite stress strains and fader criterions has helped helped us evaluate the results um, per element rather than, than as a bulk for the wheel. Um, as is the first year where we are completely committed to running composite wheels um, and we have no other option, we decided to stay on the safe side um, and aim for a factor of safety of 1.6 for the severe load case, which also carries a bit of a, another factor of safety. Uh, for the results, we obtain a minimum factor of safety of, a, of just over 1.7 um, with a minimum deflection of 1.75 millimeters at uh, the outer rim edge. Um, as part of the validation for the FEA modeling, we also uh, performed um, an FEA that simulated uh, a similar physical tensile test uh, for the material specimens uh, uh, that we we were, on, we were on tests on. Um, this resulted in relatively good correlations um, and that has allowed us to validate uh, validate our modeling uh, techniques. So for us, um, having Altair's uh, tools at our disposal um, has been beneficial to us as we have the potential to further optimize all of our designs. Um, as seen from you know, the load cases uh, we defined for uh, the wheels analysis and the, effect of, the resultant factor of safety, uh, the wheel is actually currently on the side of being slightly over-designed. Um, so with this year's car having a few major changes um, compared to previous years, uh, we've decided to manufacture these wheels as is, um, as we need to learn how to walk before we can run when it comes to our first uh, composite wheels. Um, the former student is a, a competition and environment that's built on a continuously development cycle, uh, thus having the initial model uh, set up in Obstruct um, allows us to further investigate the possibilities of optimizing the composite design uh, using the OptiStruct Composite Optimization Toolbox. Uh, we've already started this process um, of optimizing the ply layup sequence uh, for the wheel. Um, this is done in an attempt to reduce the wheel mass um, and maintain a minimum allowable deflection. Uh, although it's relatively easy to achieve a perfectly optimized wheel, we also need to take into account that the manufacturing process is done in the house um, um, and this had additional manufacturing constraints uh, and capabilities. Uh, we have found that it is important 
an important concept to understand um, as this allows us to develop an optimized design for the wheels which we're still able to manufacture ourselves. Uh, as for the future of Obion out there, uh, we're definitely looking at building and nurturing this relationship um, with the magnet, ma multitude of available softwares that we have been provided with. Uh, the team is able to find many more areas of the vehicle uh, which we can further analyze and optimize. So this is all we have for today. Um, on behalf of Oxford Bridge Racing, we'd like to thank uh, Alte uh, for their continued support and this opportunity for us to share with you guys today. Um, and we'd like to thank all of you for following this presentation. Uh, if we have time, we will be gladly accepted.